Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nucleus Investment Insights. Today's episode is called The End of Cycle Shock is Here. Earlier this week, JP Morgan bought First Republic Bank, the US's second biggest bank failure in history. Overnight, the Federal Reserve hiked rates another 25 basis points to their highest level in 16 years, along with Tuesday's surprise increase from the RBA. This morning, Jenny Craig is reportedly closing its operations after 40 years as it struggles to secure financing, and California lender PacWest Future looks uncertain. Our team have been talking about this for a long time, and today we discuss if this is the end of cycle shock we've been waiting for. Today, as always, we have Damien Klassen, Nucleus Wealth's co-founder and chief investment officer. Damo, welcome. Thanks, Sam. I'd also like to uh, welcome Nucleus Wealth's other co-founder and chief strategist, David Llewellyn-Smith. G'day, Dave. G'day, Dave. My name's Sam Kerr. I'm a senior financial advisor at Nucleus Wealth. Just a reminder, the information in this podcast is general advice and does not take into account your personal situation. <laughs> if you do want to discuss your personal financial situation, please go to our website at nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact, and you can book a call with me to have a no obligation chat. We are live every Thursday at 12.30 Sydney Melbourne time. So jump onto the Nucleus Wealth YouTube channel and you can ask any questions that come to mind and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. You can also follow us on your preferred podcast platform as our show is available on all the majors. So that's the formalities out of the way. So Dave, I'll hand it over to you to get the ball rolling. Sure, thanks, Sam. <clears throat> so um, today we wanted to return to a subject we've been covering frequently over the last couple of months, and, and that is, um, you know, has the Fed finally broken something? And uh, we think the answer is yes, uh, in the uh, accelerating small bank credit crunch in the United States. And we'll have a look at what that is, uh, as well as what it means for, for uh, economies, and then of course, assets uh, to, to round things out. Um, so without further ado, I, I might just jump in and, um, and start having a look at this credit crunch. Um, basically, you know, it started in mid-March with, you know, the sudden bank bankruptcy of Silicon Valley Bank and one or two others. Um, they looked like rather idiosyncratic events because you know, the banks that went under were doing some quite unusual things with venture capital and crypto and stuff like that, adventurous things, uh, you know, some very adventurous lending and assets on their balance sheets. And so although they they triggered, you know, some contagion into, you know, broader stuff ending in Credit Suisse going under and things, uh, they did look idiosyncratic. And so, you know, we, we weren't really sure whether that, credit crunch would advance, but, you know, we hazarded a guess it probably would. Um, but there has been mounting evidence ever since that it is. Um, and but, but can I also sort of say, Dave, there's there's a difference between that, I guess this, we, we've spoken a lot about, uh, for anyone who hasn't sort of listened to the other ones, we spoke a lot about the difference between this, this sort of imminent crisis, which is banks that um, had solvency issues as, 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 as well as possibly liquidity issues um, that that were going to cause be cause problems um, that then would flow onto a credit crunch, we, we, where all banks um, pull back on their lending uh, and and we get deposit flight from regional banks. And so, um, uh, you, I guess the next step I'd, I'd add in there was was then uh, after Credit Suisse there was a bit of an attack on Deutsche Bank, um, sort of, and and there was this thing about look, is a market's just going to start picking off the next weakest bank and then the next weakest bank. And Deutsche Bank, which which had um, you know some problems a few years ago, um, but had done a lot of work to to clean that up, um, was then eventually uh, we, well didn't didn't run into those same problems. And, and I guess that was the the part where um, you know we were starting to think, well, okay, well maybe maybe markets aren't going to chase one by one, um, and now we're going to wait for this credit crunch to really hit. But I think probably the news from the last couple of days is no, now they're back on chasing. Um, chasing banks and and we've still got to, you know quite extreme deposit outflows from some of these some of these other ones. But anyway, sorry, that's okay. Um, 
So just picking up on your last point, then what we have seen over the last week or so is more regional banks in the US suddenly get into trouble and go under and, and be seized by the FDIC. Uh, and so what appeared to be idiosyncratic is sudden, suddenly starting to look a little more typical and even systemic. Uh, you know, every week a couple of more bank of these banks pop up with problems out of the blue, and, and these look like more generic banks than the, the original group. And so um, at this point, it just looks like the very swift monetary tightening that the Fed has done uh, is challenging, you know, regional bank business models in the US. So it is starting to look a little bit more systemic. So we've got, you know, ongoing deposit outflows from these banks. Um, and, you know, as a result, the, the Fed's emergency facilities that are supporting um, their liabilities, are, you know, are, are sort of still get, still lending at a, at a pretty high rate every week. Um, the nonetheless, the these small banks are having to kind of lift their deposit rates to try and, you know, retain some of this funding, uh, which is of course, you know, rising costs and falling margins. In addition to that, they've all got liquidity problems because they're all holding a lot of treasuries, which are underwater. Now again, the Fed is doing what it can to alleviate that problem and lending against what are effectively uh, insolvent assets, but you know. It's still a problem. They've got, you know, commercial credit, um, commercial real estate exposures. Sort of 70, 80 percent of U.S. commercial real estate is through this segment of the banks. Um, it's starting to look like buybacks are cooked because margins are so under pressure and and profits are falling, which of course is smashing equity. I mean, as as we get, you know, more and more casualties in this sort of rolling problem for the for this business model. Um, you know, counterparty risk is going up, so spreads around these banks. Uh, and there have started to be a few credit downgrades as well. Uh, and so you've got what looks to be, you know, pretty problematic for this whole segment, which is roughly 40% of US credit. So it's, it's definitely material. Uh, and so that's that's kind of what, as Damo says, there are two things going on here, a bank crisis and then a credit crunch. So it looks like the bank crisis is ongoing, is the first point to make. Um, now, what was interesting overnight when we when we start talking about whether that will result in a credit crunch, um, the Fed hiked 25 overnight, but changed its statement and was very forthright about the likelihood of credit tightening coming from the banks um, instead of from it from itself um, you know change its wording to you know this may happen to it probably will happen uh, now I, I wish to posit the notion that you know it's probably um, got good data telling it that telling it that this is exactly what is happening it, you know it has its senior loan officer survey that it conducts itself and it so it already has that data even though it hasn't released it for the first quarter and that'll be coming out very soon for all of us but I suspect it will show you know a, a significant further tightening in credit standards in the US from what were already very high standards uh, and you know, importantly, as I say, they have that data. So the changing of their wording, I suspect, reflects that. Um, we've already seen it in other surveys, business surveys, the NFIB, for instance. And then, you know, every time one of these sizable kind of regional banks goes under, there's generally, a, you know, a fall in, in credit availability as these banks, you know, are forced to kind of uh, you know, pay the piper and restructure their balance sheets. They need to deleverage a bit, lend a bit less. They've got to find a bit more funding. Uh, you know, they're, 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 you know, got to be more cautious about who they're giving money to, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, get this feedback loop of bank crisis and credit crunch. And of course, where that ends is, is a slowing economy. And then, you know, we get a second wave of bank crisis uh, as, as you know, bad loans start to come in and hit the balance sheet. So I'll, I'll just flip over to the next page and have a look 
at where this where we are perhaps in this process and where we're going so this is you know the next phases of this crisis mm -hmm. if it were to follow the typical script which it looks like it will um largely because uh you know u.s inflation is still very high and the fed is not you know it, it, it made it plain last night that it was a hawkish hold if you like that is it's still con quite concerned about the level of inflation especially in services and so even though it's going to ease back on its rate hikes uh it's you know very data dependent it'll keep hiking if the economy doesn't slow but it thinks it probably will slow given this credit crunch um and so you know it's a bit of a lose-lose proposition at the moment so where are we in it i suspect you know we have sort of somewhere just past a Bear Stearns moment, if you like. Uh, you know, we've had we've had these souring bank business model problems for for a couple of months. Um, enough for um, you know stress um, to start to hit credit availability, but the economy is still kind of res resisting it and persisting, and it's slowing, but. Uh, you know, is still there. We had the jobs, the private jobs number last night, um, not the BLS, the, um, can't remember what it's called now, but still had good jobs growth going on. And there are a number of other soft data points saying, uh, saying similar, the economy is kind of chugging along 1%, maybe 1.5%. So um, we need more slowing. And, but, um, you know, I would say a comparable sort of period if we're going to compare it to the last major shock is we're just somewhere past the Bear Stearns moment. Um, but I do think that there's enough kind of bank crisis dynamics in play for it to keep going. And so we end up with something, you know, Lehman-esque in terms of import rather than scale necessarily. I'm certainly not um, predicting a similar global financial crisis or US financial crisis for that matter. But I think it is important to note that, uh, you know, there are enough sort of negative bank dynamics in play here where I think you can get a, a good enough credit crunch to give you a decent recession to feed bad debts back into the banks and extend the recession. And so if you consider the 10 years of free money context that we're in, in which we've had a lot of zombies in the economy been able to survive on the supply side uh, and and the demand side for that matter, with cheap money really holding up indebted businesses and consumers. Uh, I think a decent kind of credit crunch is gonna shake out a lot of a lot of zombies here as they are truncated. And so that gives us our second wave of shock in, back into the banking system and extends the credit crunch. So I think we're in for a decent recession, better, worse than mild, but better than terrible, moderate. Um, as the base case uh, so you know there's not that many calling for that kind of level most people most of the respectable strategists are seeing it as a mild recession um, but I think there's enough going on here for us to see it to get a little bit worse than that um, especially given you know how much how long we've had such cheap money uh, running and, and the likelihood that that is you know distorted balance sheets in the economy so, um, how quickly? Well, that's in the lap of the gods. If we're somewhere past Bear Stearns, that would suggest we're in recession within six months, um, could easily be sooner. We'll know, we'll get a better idea as, as the Fed releases its weekly lending data and these, you know, these bank, bankruptcies, FDIC saves, and then um, bailout, well, they're not really bailouts, they're, they're um, the buying of these these dying regional banks by bigger banks transpires. I think we're going to see legs down in credit availability as that transpires, and we'll get a good read on that week to week. So, uh, you know, probably in recession by mid-year in the US, and it'll probably go most of the second half, I would think, and keep getting worse. Um, as I said, not expecting absolutely... GFC kind of thing, a thing or Lehman style moment with a with a systemic bank going under, but the regional banks in aggregate are systemic, and so you do have a systemic crisis of sorts in this segment of the bank banking sector uh, in the US, 
And, uh, you know, who knows with the interconnectedness of these things these days, you know, we may end up with a troubled systemic bank as well at some point. Don't know. Um, but you can't say, say never uh, in such an inter interconnected system these days. It is true that they've got much better capital and what have you, but you, you just never know. So, yeah. um, and some of the banks that that have run into problems had had very good capital ratios. You know, three days before yeah, they that's um, right. they, yeah. they went under. So yes. you know, that's you're looking at. I think looking at individual, looking at the aggregate, I think gives you probably more hope on on that front. Looking at individual banks, I don't think I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't be. You know, if investors are out there trying to pick the bottom in in some of these names. Um, yeah, you do, you will need to look bit more deeper than, than just saying hey yeah this this thing's got you know 10 percent um you know risk weighted assets to to and so therefore it's safe you know it's not going to fall over because yeah there's there's um the way the way things are reported um yeah all right well i mean the investors aren't actually even trying to buy the regional banks at the moment they're still getting flogged their equity is still evaporating um and the etf the kre etf for regional banks is still in free fall is down by nearly half over this year, which is really interesting. I didn't provide this chart. I meant to, but I'll come to it later. If you look at the KRE versus, you know, the Dow Jones over over the history, they, they track one another pretty well. Um, but at the moment, one of them's down by half and the other one's ignoring it completely. <laughs> so it's like, well, one of them's wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so, I mean, and that's that's it's it's a dichotomy here, isn't it? Where you're saying, okay, you know, whatever it is, sixty percent of, of small business lending and all these other stats, is you saying, okay, well, one part of the market's saying there is something dire going on, and the other part of the market's saying, yeah, no, sh everything should be fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I know which one I think is right. Anyway, yeah, and we'll repeat we'll repeat that theme a few more times through throughout this. We will. So, um, so. So, I mean, the Fed's basically got itself into a position where it's broken something big enough to kill inflation with a recession. Now, it doesn't probably really need to hike anymore. I don't think it really needed to hike today. Um, I think it was already broken. Uh, but it can just sit now and watch it and wait for it to fall apart. Now, when you do that, you, you know, you're, you're playing with tipping points and momentum and things that really do take on a mind of their own. And so the likelihood is, I think, that it gets worse than most people expect, um, including the Fed. <clears throat> um, and then it's forced to, to cut deeper than expected as well. Um, but not until, you know, the, we see the whites of the eyes uh, in the market and the recession. And by the time they cut, I think it's too late to avoid any, you know, serious recessionary fallout. And yeah, I mean, we're gonna, we've got nine months more at least, probably 12 months of of, of impact from just from the rate rises they've been doing over the last six that's months. That's right, yeah. So, yeah. so, so as this base case US recession takes place and, you know, pretty decent one at that, um, then you, you start to think about the, <clears throat> um, the spillovers for the rest of the world because when you, you will see rising unemployment from, from, uh, the credit crunch in small business in particular in the US, and that should choke off the consumer. Uh, and, you know, we've still got pretty high inventories in the US economy, so they, they will destock, and that's immediately a shock for <clears throat> both China and Europe who export so much into the US economy. So um, Europe is going to get an external shock from the US, um, and... Um, it's actually got a fair bit of these problems going on as well. Um, the ECB uh, uh, released its senior loan officer survey earlier this week, and it's also got a credit crunch going uh, pretty goodly, credit crunch going. Uh, and so, you know, Europe's going to intrinsically slow um, on similar dynamics to the US. It's not as bad, and the Euro European banks have been wrestling with you know, such low volumes of lending and such low margins for so long that, um, you know, that they're, they're having having kind of had rate hikes, they're, they're sort of, you know, finding themselves in Nirvana with their margins. So they'll, they'll probably fare better. But 
you know, Europe's still going to have this this double problem of external shock and 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 tightening credit. So I, I expect it will also go into recession sometime later this year, trailing the US, uh, which is why one of the reasons why I'm not sure everyone why, why everyone wants to buy European equities. But um, anyway, so and uh, you know, finally, um, we can't let this discussion go without uh, talking about China and. Uh, you know, you can expect China to get an external shock too, probably worse than Europe's because it, it, it's more export dependent and it will be suffering from both Europe and China demand dropping. Yeah. Um, but not probably not as, uh, as much problem in terms of credit. Not as much. Well, it's got its own credit problems from its housing yeah. shakeout, but and, and that is very regional bank focused. But yeah, but they're, they're but they so same problem with regional banks saying they're tightening up and because they'll have the central government saying they will look they manage their banks differently they're all you know very centrally controlled and, and so they, as we've said many times they'll take those bad debts and they'll shoot them somewhere out the back so they'll figure out figure a way out but the most important thing to note is that that, that adjustment to property uh in china is is ongoing um like they have loosened up on it and um, encouraged, you know, the developers to to build, you know, the in terms of kind of underlying demand, but the developers do not have access to dollar bond financing the way they used to, and so that adjustment which we've been tracking for the last sort of eighteen months, two years, is not over at all, and in fact, it looks like it's permanent. Uh, and so that's the end of supercharged Chinese growth and mega stimulus, because that's the key, you know, kind of uh, transmission mechanism of that was always building, you know, ghost cities with m super leveraged developers. And that's done. So as we go into this, you know, North Atlantic shock, China's not going to save it. It's not going to save the world with mega stimulus. Chinese property is not available anymore as that lever to pull for the world. And so that's not great, you know, for commodities, which is is actually pretty good for killing inflation. Um, so so that's the sort of general wrap uh, that we see. And I, we're going to then what take a look at that earnings demo and see if, see yeah. if the market is, has, has sort of set up for this at all. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I think that the... the uh... The chart I think that spells spells out the you know, the situation best is is this next earnings chart. Now, this is just the S and P five hundred. It's it's relatively similar to what's happening globally, but um, you know, I think that there's much more of a focus in the US on quarterly numbers. And so, um, I thought I'd bring up this one. And what it's showing is how earnings forecasts have changed over time. So, the and, and we're looking at percentage growth number. So for for Q one. Uh, which is just being reported right now. You know, originally uh, analysts had that sort of pegged at, at being sort of 13% growth and, and uh, back in um, uh, a year ago. And then as time went on, uh, we just saw downgrades, 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 and it's come in now at sort of minus seven, minus five to seven. You know, so it's still, there's a bit, you get some lumpy ones from day to day, but yeah, sort of it, it, it's declined quite quite markedly over that time frame. Q2, um, so the next quarter, is has basically done the same thing. It's sort of down to almost minus seven as well in terms of its growth, and it's sort of followed. Uh, Q3 has been a little bit better, uh, but it's, it's probably just an argument that's further away. You've got six months more. If it sort of keeps going on the, the same trajectory it's on, we would just keep seeing those downgrades, and it, then it'll end up at sort of that same growth rate. Uh, Q4 is the interesting one. Um, you know, expectations of a, almost 10% growth uh, are still sort of in analyst numbers for, for the fourth quarter. And and the flip side is you at that point, you've got the, the bond market telling us there's going to be recessions and rate cuts. And so, um, uh, you yeah, know, numbers are not reflecting, the, the aggregate numbers are not reflecting any problems. It's it's that very much a dichotomy that, that uh, you know, analyst forecasts for now are, are saying things are going to be uh, pretty good um, by the fourth quarter, just as everyone said, everyone else thinks that the whole thing is going to be falling apart. So, so lots of room to, be, to see some downgrades for that. Um, in terms of the actual reporting season, look, the only the numbers have been relatively good. I've got some uh, uh, chart up to sort of showing um, the distribution, the percentiles of, of 
of companies and, and a look at the next 12 months forecasts, the, uh, the, the 2023 forecasts and the 2024 forecasts. And, and by and large, you know, the median company is, is, um, is coming out with some, some relatively minor upgrades. Uh, there is a, um, uh, some of the key sectors, energy materials in particular, uh, are being hit. Uh, and banks, energy and materials banks, you're seeing downgrades. But, but a lot of the other sectors have, have come through with, with relatively good results um, and, and talking up the, the, the story. Uh, in particular, I think it's worth noting, though, that uh, a lot of that's been on, on the back of um, uh, volumes, poor volumes, but, but good margins. And so what I mean by that is, you know, there's a lot of companies talking about... Um, you know, volume, they're selling whatever they're selling, and um, that's actually falling in terms of the number of number of things that they've sold. But they managed to get through a price rise. So you know, you, you've you, we've, we sold five percent less than what we did um, you know last year, but we managed to get through a ten percent price increase. And so mm. net net, we're 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 doing fine. Now that's I mean, that's the the gap between nominal and real GDP there. Yeah. Like the US yeah. is doing what one one and a half percent GDP and five percent nominal. Yes, and that's all price rise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, th this is fine for you know it, it's fine at at the at certain points of the cycle, and, and if you're headed into a recession, which we're we're pretty sure we are, then then that whole business model stops. You know, when when you've got you know. And, and maybe five percent overstating it, you know. For a lot of companies, it's probably you know, yeah, you know, three percent, two to three percent down down in terms of volumes, and and five to ten percent up in in prices, and and you know, you, you go all right. Once you once your volumes really start to get hit, though, now companies have to make this decision. Well, okay, I've got a factory that I'm 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 only running, or 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 a distribution, or or a shop, or whatever it is that I'm only running at at you know, seventy percent capacity or sixty percent capacity. Do I just accept that that's going to go down to fifty percent capacity, and, and I start you know really eating to, into my margins because of my I've got these fixed costs that, that that's, or do I actually try and discount and and get my you know get a bigger market share, and and what tends to happen is companies discount they try and get a big market bigger market share, um, they find if they put prices up then they 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 lose way more than what they they're going to gain, and so then you start to get into this discounting of how can I get you know how much volume can I get back. And, and that's typical throughout most recessions. Um, it does look like that, you know, given what we're seeing on the on the credit side, you know, that's our view of what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, it, it, I guess it's important to say uh, we're not seeing signs of what we're talking about in earnings numbers. Earnings numbers are, are, are if anything, telling us, um, you know, slightly the opposite story. Uh, but we do think when we dig into it uh, that, that this is one of those, um, you know, it's a Wiley Coyote, moment where he's 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 off the edge of the cliff and mm. and you know he's still hanging in midair and just doesn't realize it yet but the uh the, the bottom of the you know his his base has fallen away and so um yeah i think uh if you're whatever stocks you're buying in terms of looking at their earnings numbers you need to be uh very cynical about about what is you, what you're seeing uh and really focusing in on these quality companies um, if you talk through some of the large tech ones that they've done pretty well, um, uh, and you know, the, there's, I think in a way, uh, a, a lot of what the, the good performance was, was sorry, the good share price performance we saw in, in that sector was, um, more about things not being worse. So sort of like, Hey, um, you know, Google beat its forecast by a little bit and seemed to be all right, you know, not blowing the, not blowing the doors off or anything, but it's um forecast but um we were worried it might be way worse and so that's where the uh you know that's where you know that's why the share price is going up it's, it's sort of a, a relief rally so to speak in in, in terms of you know oh, i was i was a bit worried that they were going to have a big fall and so the fact they didn't have a big fall um you know then sort of justifies that that price rise uh one of the other ones that one of the key members of our portfolio meta um is that's got some weird stuff going on that was probably one of the the one that gets the most sort of um 
I guess, uh, airplay in terms of having, you know, good performance and, and stock prices risen. So I think 60 odd percent or something like that in the last few months. And, and, um, you know, some really, you know, everything sounds very positive. I, I, I think there's a lot of idiosyncratic things going on with that. And, and our, our thesis uh, for owning that stock was always that, um, you're effectively buying two things. You're buying this reality labs, um, which is, uh, all their 3d and, and the meta. Um, at the whole metaverse, and that's hugely loss making. Um, makes almost no prof- no, no revenues at all. But but um, uh, Zuckerberg's you know very focused on spending lots of money to to try and get it up and running and build the infrastructure for it. And then you have the the underlying business, which um, is very cash generative. And and so what we saw in this um, in this latest result was. Uh, some improvement in terms of the the the, the actual underlying business of their um, uh, selling ads, but it's a bit of a weird improvement in that their volumes really rocketed. So the amount of ads they're showing um, increased uh, dramatically, while the cost per ad, the the revenue they're getting per ad plummeted. And so um, I think it's sort of like twenty eight percent or something like that, twenty seven twenty eight percent in terms of volumes versus uh, the eighteen percent or something in in terms of prices. And so. Um, there's definitely some weird stuff going on and you don't want to sort of read into that as, as being a particularly strong advertising market. Um, and then, uh, and then, but the, but the real thing is behind it is, is, is effectively, I think the market coming to a similar view to ours is that if you take this metaverse and you, and you, if you just valued it at zero and then look at the rest of the business as a standalone, you know, it looks relatively cheap as a, as a, as a, as a company. Well, actually it used to look extremely cheap now, given all the price rises, it's, it's not, horrendously expensive but it's but it's um you know it's certainly uh a, a lot more expensive than where it was you know when the share price was 60 percent lower um you know a few months ago and so um and so it's not a stock which we really want to draw out and say okay that's that's uh going to give us a view about what's happening with the market uh so yes yeah, so that's that's the reporting season um uh, I probably we might go into more detail in future weeks in that. I wanted to jump to the to the Aussie market because there's there's another problem that's um, all this uh, credit crunch stuff that uh, you know really brings to, to play within um, within the Australian market. And I, and I wanted to highlight as well. Um, so we posted up uh, a property update yesterday, and uh, just highlighting that you know if you took the view that. When people buy property, what they're effectively buying is uh, what they're effectively doing is just in Australia they're deciding between do I go with the, the um, standard variable rate or do do I go with a fixed rate? And if you made the assumption that people take whatever's the lowest one of those, <clears throat> uh, interest rates haven't actually moved for the last six months. If you took that view, because what's been happening is we've been seeing. Um, uh, yes, the the standard variable rate's been rising as the as the uh, RBA keeps increasing rates, hasn't been increasing as fast as, as what the RBA has because banks have been uh, busily discounting as well. Um, and at the same time, fixed rates, they did they rocketed um, uh, in the early part of last year, but actually from, from late last year, three-year fixed rates really haven't moved much at all. And they've actually, you know, from certain points, they've, they've even fallen a little. And so, um, you know, on that basis, you know, the effective mortgage rate that the people are facing when they're going out to buy new houses hasn't really changed for for six months and um and that sort of lines up very much with where when we saw the property sector uh turn around and, and prices start to, to to edge higher rather than uh rather than keep falling so that's that's one issue um the second issue which is <clears throat> sort of fall more into this problem of defaults is uh i've got a chart up um just showing the difference between the standard variable rate and the discounted rate and so, um, and, and the other thing is the discounted rate. This is these are these all come from the RBA. Um, you know, the discounted standard variable rate might actually, or it doesn't seem to be reflecting the the, the level of discounting that the banks are doing as well for for their their higher uh, quality credits. But basically, the, the the difference is blown out by it's basically double what what it used to be. And um, so so yeah, so if you're there's a not, there's there's two things going on there, I think. One, one, the the sharp rise in rates has been very negative to for system growth. So they're all competing their asses off to pinch market share, uh, which is a good example of what you were just talking about before. What happens when the market stops growing? Mm-hmm. Um, 
and second i reckon a lot of this is the is the fixed rate uh, roll off where you know we've had many many what uh, about a quarter of the banking book in the process of rolling off the very cheap COVID fixed rate loans um, mm. onto the variable rate. And so the banks have been discounting their asses off on those variable rates to prevent an accident, basically. Yeah. And and so what you're seeing then is we're seeing that, um, you know, if you're a good credit, you can turn up to a bank and, and you know, you, you, you blow your 80% threshold and your money's still coming in, you haven't lost your job and all these things like that, then you're probably paying somewhere between 5 and 6% on your on your mortgage. If you're borderline though, and and you've got a few questionable issues, uh, and you and you and you can't access these these discounted rates, then you're probably paying closer to eight percent. So in a way, um, what we're looking at is well, that's actually the RBA is talking about eight percent as being the number, and that's before the latest um, rise. And so um, the issue here is you've got two cohorts: one that can probably handle higher interest rates, but they're not being given higher interest rates. Uh, and the second group is the ones that can't, and they're being forced into interest rates that are sort of two or three percent above the first group. And so, what that means is, um, you know, we're really looking at a um, if there is an accident, and if that, and we do start to see some problems, that uh, you don't need it to be a broad-based event in in the Australian housing market to to start seeing some some real hits. So, uh, you know, you just need a a large enough, uh, you know. A cohort of people to, to to run into problems and to be forced to selling to then see another leg down in house prices and the danger i guess what i'm seeing is that you know the the the, the bank pricing is helping is it is exacerbating that situation so um uh yeah so so i think there's a that sort of continues on to that problem of saying well okay well if if things go all right then yeah, maybe we have seen. We've spoken before. Yeah, maybe we have seen the, the bottom or close to the bottom in terms of house prices. That if it's only a mild recession and that cohort of people manage to, to to not be forced to sell, but the danger is you know that 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 cohort is forced to be is forced to sell. And then the second part, the second Australian problem then is comes back to actually pricing on the banks. Now, if you look at bank pricing uh, relative to sort of longer term histories, uh, it's about average uh, Australian bank pricing. It's about average to the to the Australian long-term um, histories. The issue is uh, banks elsewhere around the world are really starting to get look very, very cheap and, and at the bottom end of their trading ranges. And so what that means is that the Australian banks are sort of trading at their 95th percentile or something like that uh, of, range, of valuation ranges relative to the rest of the world. So um, uh, there is an expectation baked in that, that the Australian banks are gonna be way better than, than, than their world peers. And uh, you know the the average, on average, um, Australian banks trade at sort of somewhere between a ten and twenty percent premium to to, to global banks, um, probably based on the fact that they've got you know quite a, let's say a friendly relationship with regulators and and they're sort of allowed to earn higher returns and, and are relatively oligopolistic, <laughs> so you know, they get some benefits from that. Uh, right now, we're talking about almost a sixty percent. Um, premium to, to global markets. So yeah, uh, which is not a, uh, you know, this, this is not the type of market. Um, if you're concerned about banks at all and concerned about this tail risks, then the last thing you want to be doing is paying sort of three times higher premium to, to world banks than what you usually pay. So, Can I just say as well, if you look at the NAB result today, which missed expectations across the board and got absolutely punished, um you are seeing these dynamics play out in earnings already um uh, i i think I, there's a bit of a tension between damo's view and mine on the banks in that i think as i said i think a lot of people who are who need to get access to cheaper credit are but uh, especially those who are on fixed rates rolling off onto variable. But um, that in itself is a massive mortgage war between the banks. 
um, as I said, because the system isn't growing and there's all these roll-offs where everybody's looking to get a the best possible variable. And so that's, that's why there's been this frenzy of refinancing. And uh, <coughs> this mortgage war means that a lot of mortgage books have basically been operating at back books, have been operating at a loss for the last kind of six to 12 months. Um, and sorry, I should say front books, not back books. And, and they're... Um, that's what hit the NAB result today, basically. So, so either way, the banks rescue the housing market, or they don't. Well, they rescue the bank market at the cost of their own earnings. Yes. They, either yeah. way, their earnings are in trouble. Is the point? Yeah. So, and then yeah. that's before we start factoring in, you know, any any kind of uh, unforeseen spillovers from a deterioration in global spreads coming out of the US and the regional bust, which, you know, as we've already described, we expect to get worse. So that would be another headwind for the Aussie banks. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say, that I don't really expect there to be any kind of credit crunch here, um, but I don't think the banks are in a good spot as an investment anyway. So, so that probably brings us to the investment outlook, does it, or have we got... Just, just quickly, Dave, we're just going to jump to a short message. We'll be back with the investment insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. If you like what you're hearing and want some help with the investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investment. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds, and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international and Australian share portfolios. These are chosen using our quality and value investment philosophy. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. So now we have our question of the week. So this is for viewers to have some discussion in the comment section over the coming days. And the question for this week is, is it time to act or do investors need to wait for more signs? So feel free to post your thoughts and engage with us and some of the other viewers over the coming days. And yeah, Dave, now it's time for investment implications. Sure, so just starting with Forex, uh, you know, um, I think the Australian dollar has more downside just on the basic risk off proposition of, of global growth facing an adjustment um, on the back of this uh, US credit crunch. Uh, if you're looking for a safe haven, um, I mean, I'm not sure it's it's uh, the US dollar at this point. There are, there are all sorts of cross currents on the US dollar and this chart looks incredibly bearish. Um, uh, it's been falling consistently. It has been very high, so it's, you know, it's still very elevated. Uh, then we've got the, the, you know, possible debt ceiling accident to come, plus the US being the epicenter of this banking problem. Uh, I mean, it's a kind of thin point, it's kind of, I would say as long as it's all kind of uh, like low level and not panicked, then probably your US dollar keeps falling. But if it does reach a tipping point where it becomes systemic and a real problem, then the US, it's gonna go and complete reverse and go and soar. So I'm a little bit, uh, I'm unusually um, skeptical of the US dollar. Uh, at this point in the cycle, and so I'm just we're just kind of out of forex as a result because the euro is just the the mirror image of that, and gold is looking quite good, um, and uh, you know I've been sort of selling a buy the dips approach to gold, which I think is good, and it's benefits from the debt ceiling stuff as well. But again, it's possible that if this all gets sort of converges into a nasty accident, then gold may well get flogged if the US dollar goes up. So again, finding that one a little bit more um, uncertain than normally at this stage of the um, cycle. Um, we're, we're, we're like, you know, long bonds and cash, um, expecting, you know, inflation to come off considerably from here still. 
um, you know, obviously a recessionary environment should be should be good at cleaning out stagflation and um, yield should fall. And especially, as I said, where we see the Fed having probably overcooked it and and this, this credit crunch, you know, taking on a life of its own, um, you know, therefore leading to, sh to quite sharp cuts, you know, later this year and into 2024. That's a good, good environment for bonds. Um, not, not fond of commodities. Um, even though the US dollar is falling, as said, that's a little bit uncertain, but uh, just don't, don't see the underlying drivers for commodities here. Um, global recession effectively, you know, China not saving us, um, lots of commodities with oversupply, especially in the bulks and in certain energies, um, you know, they look more more undersupplied in base metals and things, but they're very, very cyclically dependent um, and and so just not a great place to be, I don't think. So I, I, I'm very, we're short of commodities, basically. Um, <clears throat> uh, Australian property, as we've discussed, you know, we're sort of bouncing along the bottom there um, with the risks both way, both ways. Um, in, in equities, um, you know, our factor allocations are, are uh, you know, very um, defensive. We're avoiding growth and value, um, which tend to be, uh, you know, more more promising in, um, well, value at the, you know, sort of tail end of the cycle, uh, but not the actual end of the cycle. Uh, so banks and miners, we're avoiding. Um, Growth is, is an interesting one. I mean, we've got some reasonable sort of tech exposures, but we we tend more towards quality because um, we think that uh, this story of sort of losing pricing power into recession means that those with good good quality business models, uh, you know, that the that, that point of difference that have pricing power, will have better quality pricing power are going to do better. Uh, and then, of course, defensives. And, and, you know, we're looking very closely at AI as well uh, into the next cycle and looking at, in particular, at service companies, quality service companies that we think have, uh, you know, the potential to lose a, to lo lose a lot of costs uh, using AI um, and redu reduced headcount. Uh, in specific sectors, you know, we're avoiding REITs, non-banks um, on, the, on the commercial real estate shake out discretionary retail super funds um discretionary obviously on on economic headwinds super funds on on uh commercial real estate as well materials as described um and then defensives with the where longer you know staples healthcare utilities etc so pretty pretty classic uh you, you know kind of uh fetal position going into a recession uh, with perhaps the exception of the doubts around the US dollar. Excellent. Uh, so I just want to make a comment, guys. Uh, a lot of the things you've been talking about for an extended period of time have been coming to fruition recently. And uh, uh, the in the active portfolios, you know, I, I know you've been positioned for this for, for a long time. Uh, and then uh, performance has been really strong over the last couple of months on a relative basis. Uh, and, you know, Dave, like you just mentioned then, you know, I understand the active portfolios, you've been underweight banks, underweight resources, except for gold, uh, that's obviously been on a tear, and overweight uh, quality stocks, and a lot of the tech stocks as well, uh, which have also done well. So I want to put a question back to both of you regarding positioning. Uh, I, I want to ask, you know, do you expect these sectors to continue to do well? Or when do you think uh, going to be the right time to switch out? Yeah, so I mean, I think the one of the key ones on and what you're saying is, you know, we've like take the Australian portfolio. We've we've had some extreme outperformance versus the the Australian market over the last uh, year or so. Uh, the issue has been that the um, that hasn't you know markets have been genuinely relatively weak over that period, and 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 I think that's sort of typically how you see our performance on on a relative basis is, you know, if we can pick up um, outperformance on the way down and then sort of match the market or or, or or you know, better if we can on the, on the way up. Um, we sort of feel that gives a much 
a much better profile for people's investments in terms of how they um you know how we're achieving those investments um and i think as well you know we obviously went through a period where um we weren't as as bullish as as, as what the rest of the market was and and we sort of lagged a little bit behind and then um, you know all of the factors which we've been talking about have, have come home to roost, and that's um, you know that's obviously driven driven some some uh, quite reasonable performance for our portfolios you know, rel- on a relative basis. Unfortunately, sometimes that's not the you know it's, it's not a it's not a sales technique that 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 people like to hear because um, you know that's the, if you're doing the opposite, if if you're just supercharging everything on the way up and the way down, then then on the way up you can talk about how you know you can have these fantastically great years you know the market market was up 20 and we were up 30 and then um you know but but those companies when the market's down 10 they, they, they might be down 20 and um and and so you know it gives them that that good story whereas when when we've got the good story about saying yes we've done a lot better than than this market which did really badly um you know it's not as it's not as as attractive as you know the market's just fallen 10 percent our portfolio only went down by two or three um you know over a cycle that pays off because you just you get the you know, you pick up and, and and you protect yourself on the downside but in in the actual action you know it's not a uh it's not a not a great sales tool to jump out and say, tell people that um, you know that this is what you're doing, but but it is indicative of what we're trying to do within our portfolios and and for people that are hanging with us over that longer term cycle, that's where um, we see them pick up the benefits. Yeah, um, I would say Sam that there is more ahead uh, until the Fed cuts. Um, I would hold this positioning until then, or the market, you know, sniffs the Fed about to break. Um, that would be probably the turning point for when we would be looking at reallocating. Um, but until, until then, I would expect our performance in these spaces to continue. Okay, nice one. Um, so we're just going to go to a quick message again. We'll be back again shortly. If you like what you're hearing but want a low-cost passive option, Nucleus Wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in Australia. The first generation of passive investing was index funds. The next gen was ETFs. Now direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost 100 different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. So I just want to talk about a couple of the, obviously in that video, uh, screens and tilts and some potential ways that investors can play these market conditions within our portfolios. Uh, So with the tilts, you could add an extra exposure to quality stocks and large tech stocks. Uh, like we've talked about, but I mean, there are some questions around valuation uh, just with those tech stocks there. Uh, And then with the screens, you could exclude global finance stocks, for example, Aussie banks and limit Aussie housing exposure. Uh, So there are some of the tilts and screens you can take advantage of there. Uh, So that's pretty much wraps us up today. So uh, Dave, Damo, thank you very much. Thanks again for sharing your insights and putting your views out there. Thanks, Sam. Pleasure. Yeah, and I'm sure everyone's looking forward to next week. Um, So if you enjoy our content, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Just click the bell below to make sure you don't miss out on any special episodes and future content. And we do put out a lot of other content in addition to this podcast. Uh, If you like the video, uh, please like the video now. And if you know of anyone that might get some value out of today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you can please share it with them. We do welcome your feedback on this podcast, especially in regards to suggestions for future topics. If you do have any ideas, please drop it in the comment section below or send us an email at contact at nucleuswealth.com. And if you'd like to look at the slides in more detail, we'll post them in the show notes this afternoon and you can view these at nucleuswealth.com forward slash webinars. So from myself, Damien, Dave, and the rest of the team at Nucleus Wealth, thanks for, thanks for watching and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now.